everyone, I'm Stephanie Peart, and welcome back to the Salty Science Podcast. In last week's episode, we started talking about the sun and began getting into the concept of solar radiation. And just as a quick recap, remember that the sun is this giant mass of hot gas, and it's roughly 70% hydrogen and about 28% helium, plus a number of other atoms such as carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, neon, iron, silicon, magnesium, and sulfur. And so the sun, it just hangs out there in the middle of our solar system, known as the Milky Way. And the Earth rotates around the sun in an elliptical pattern so that the distance between the sun and the Earth changes from about 147 to 152 million kilometers, or 91 to 94 million miles. And in science, because this is such a huge distance, we call the average distance from the Earth to the sun one astronomical unit, or AU. And one astronomical unit equals about 93 million miles, or 150 million kilometers. And so when we look at distances in space, we use the astronomical unit. For example, the distance between the sun and the Earth is one astronomical unit, but the distance from the sun to Mars is about one and a half astronomical units units. And the sun to Jupiter is about 5.2 astronomical units. And the sun to Neptune is about 30 astronomical units. And believe it or not, we actually use this information in marine science, especially when we're looking at solar gravitational influences on our tides. But more on that later. So moving forward, in the last episode, we also mentioned that the sun produces massive amounts of energy in the form of electromagnetic radiation. And this is due to nuclear fusion occurring in the sun's core. And nuclear fusion here is where four hydrogen atoms, or their nuclei, are squeezed together under a whole lot of pressure, turning it into one helium atom. And when this happens, a major amount of energy is released due to some fun nuclear quantum mechanics. And like I said in the last episode, it can take millions of years for this energy to travel from the core of the sun to the outer layer or surface layer called the corona. But once it gets to the corona, it only takes about 8 minutes for this energy to reach the earth. And finally, we also discussed how the electromagnetic radiation or energy from our sun resembles black body radiation. And just as a reminder, a black body is an idealized object which absorbs and emits all radiation frequencies. And black body radiation is a term that we use to describe the relationship between an object's temperature and the wavelengths of electromagnetic radiation that it emits or gives off. And any object with a temperature above absolute zero, or zero Kelvin, gives off electromagnetic radiation, including you and me. And since the sun has a pretty stable, or roughly a constant temperature, it acts like an ideal black body. And quick disclaimer, the sun is not a perfect black body, but we can use the concept of a black body, or relate the sun to being a black body, to help us understand it better. So the sun acts like a black body because it emits electromagnetic radiation along the full spectrum of wavelengths, from the super tiny gamma wavelengths all the way to the really long radio wavelengths. However, the majority of the sun's electromagnetic radiation wavelengths occurs within what we call the visible wavelength range, and more specifically at the yellow-green wavelengths of about 500 to 590 nanometers. And FYI, this is why the sun appears yellowish white in the sky. It's because of all of this. And it was the Nobel Prize winner Max Planck who developed what we call Planck's Law, as well as Wilhelm Wien, who developed what we call Wien's Displacement Law, which relates an object's spectral density, or the majority of specific wavelengths emitted from an object to its temperature. And so, because of these two great guys, we can, for instance, understand that when we see our sun, we see a yellowish white because it's related to the temperature of the sun, which is about 508,000 to 6,000 Kelvin. And their laws, the Planck Law and Wien's Displacement Law, also helps us understand the different colors of the different stars we see. So our sun appears as a yellowish white because of its temperature. And let's say for the purposes of this episode, we'll just say that it's 6,000 Kelvin. So versus a cooler star, a cooler star would appear actually more red and a slightly hotter star would actually appear bluish purple. And this concept of relating an object's temperature to its color also follows the same principle as when you look at a candle or like the flame of a candle. And with a candle, or any type of fire, it's hotter at the base where it appears blue versus the top where it appears yellow. 
And this all comes back to Planck's law and Vane's displacement law. And fun side fact, I have had the pleasure of learning all about this in one of my physical oceanography classes in grad school at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science. Okay, so now moving on. So you have Planck's law, you have Vane's displacement law. And now, if we look at the Stefan-Boltzmann law, the Stefan-Boltzmann law describes the power radiated from a black body in terms of its temperature. Or more specifically, the Stefan-Boltzmann law states, the total energy radiated per unit surface area of a black body across all wavelengths per unit time is directly proportional to the fourth power of the black body's thermodynamic temperature. But in other words, the Stefan-Boltzmann law basically says that the total amount of energy coming from any black body is equal to its temperature raised to the fourth power, and then multiplied by a constant number that we call the Stefan-Boltzmann constant. So the sun's temperature, as I said before, is about 5,800 Kelvin, and some sources say 5,700 Kelvin, and others say 6,000 Kelvin, but for the sake of this episode, we'll assume that the temperature of the sun is 6,000 Kelvin. And so if we were to raise it to the fourth power, meaning we just multiply 6,000 times 6,000 times 6,000 times 6,000, that gives us about 1.3 times 10 to the 15, or 13 plus 15 zeros after the number. That's a really big number. And then if we multiply it by the Stefan-Boltzmann constant, which is derived from other physics concepts, and is roughly about 5.7 times 10 to the negative 8, which is a really small number, which then when you do the math and you take into account any emissivity or gray body tendencies, we get the value of the energy flux, or in other words, we get the amount of energy per time per area, or the power of the sun per area. And if you remember from physics, or here, I'm telling you right now, energy is defined as the quantitative property that must be transferred to an object in order to perform work or to heat an object. And the unit for energy is the joule, named after James Prescott Joule. And power is defined as the rate or per time of doing work or of transferring heat. So for instance, if you carry a box up a flight of stairs, the actual work of carrying a box stays the same regardless of how fast or how slow you do it. But if you can run up the stairs versus walk up the stairs, you definitely have more power because you did it in a smaller amount of time. So power is energy transfer or work per time. And the unit that we use to describe power is the joule per second, also known as the watt, in honor of James Watt. So then getting back to the Stefan-Boltzmann equation, the answer gives us watt, or energy per time, or power, per area. And the area unit we use is square meters. And I'm taking the time to say all of this because the sun is the source of energy for most life on Earth, including life in the ocean, as well as is the main source of energy impacting the temperature of the global ocean. And so to say it once again, the sun is a star that is heated to super high temperatures by the conversion of nuclear binding energy due to the fusion of hydrogen atoms into helium atoms at its core, which releases a huge amount of electromagnetic radiation energy that travels from the sun to the Earth a distance of a approximately one astronomical unit in eight minutes. And thanks to scientists like Kershaw, Planck, Levine, Stefan, and Boltzmann, plus all the great scientists and engineers who made it possible for us to have satellites in space orbiting around our planet, that we are actually able to measure the total incoming solar radiation from our sun. Which, I don't know, I just personally think that is super cool. And so the total amount of incoming radiation or energy from the sun has been determined to be approximately between 1.36 and 1.37 kilowatts per square meter. And this is also known as the solar constant, which comes in the form of wavelengths across the whole electromagnetic spectrum, but mostly in the range of the 380 to 740 nanometer range, which is also known as the visible light range. And thank you, sun, because this range is actually part of the spectrum that our eyes can actually see. So yay, thank you, sun. Okay, so like I just said, the energy arriving at Earth's atmosphere is between 1.36 and 1.37 kilowatts per square meter, and the value varies depending on Earth's distance from the sun, as well as if the sun's producing any solar flares. But for the sake of this episode, we'll just say that it's 1.37 kilowatts per square meter. And so if our planet was a different shape, we might actually receive all of this energy. But because the Earth is a sphere, the total energy intercepted by the Earth is a disk shape 
with an area of pi r squared, where r is Earth's radius, and then it's distributed over a hemisphere of surface area of 4 times pi r squared, which then basically means, when you do all the math, that instead of the Earth receiving 1.37 kilowatts per square meter of energy, on average, the Earth is only receiving about 340 watts per square meter at the top of the atmosphere. And like I said earlier, this energy or radiation hitting Earth's atmosphere is mostly wavelengths of visible light, but also includes some ultraviolet or UV radiation as well as infrared wavelengths. And then on average, of this 340 watts per square meter of radiation energy at the top of our atmosphere, about 30% is actually reflected back into space, either by reflecting off of clouds or particles in the atmosphere, or even being reflected off of the Earth's surface. For instance, snow and sand are great at reflecting solar radiation back up into space. And FYI, we call this ability to reflect back up an object's albedo. And so of the remaining 70%, roughly 17% gets absorbed by our atmosphere by particles such as oxygen molecules, ozone molecules, water molecules, and carbon dioxide molecules. And so for instance, a lot of the UV or ultraviolet wavelengths gets absorbed by ozone particles in our atmosphere. And if we didn't have what we call the ozone layer, we'd have more UV radiation pouring down on us. Which would then mean everyone would have to start investing in a whole lot of sunscreen because we'd all be getting burnt to a crisp. And so the part of the solar radiation that actually reaches Earth's surface is what we call insulation. And on arrival at the sea surface, depending on the ocean conditions, some of this energy will be reflected back up due to the water's albedo, or it'll be absorbed or backscattered in the water column. And we'll be discussing all of this in future episodes because each part of this plays an important role in the ocean. But there might be something that you're already aware of that I haven't mentioned yet. The whole Earth doesn't receive the same amount of solar radiation or insulation. And that's because the intensity of insulation depends primarily on the angle that the sun's rays strike the surface of the Earth, which varies with latitude, season, and even time of day. So why do marine scientists care about all this solar radiation and insulation stuff? Well, one of the reasons that I personally care is because it directly impacts my own research. For instance, in developing ecosystem models, I have to take into account for daily and seasonal solar radiation or insulation, which then impacts seasonal water temperatures and light availability and, and light attenuation, which has a direct impact on rates of photosynthesis, which then also impacts nutrient cycling and water quality, and so many other areas of my research. For me, it's a pretty big deal. And for just about every marine scientist from every discipline, solar radiation or insulation will play either a direct or indirect role in their research because it impacts the sea surface temperatures, chemical cycles, distribution of marine life, and even determines the amount of sunscreen they have to bring into the field or on the boat with them. Okay, so now, once again, I will leave you with the fun challenge of answering the question, why should I care? Or why should a non-career scientist care about the sun and solar radiation and insulation? And if you would like to email me your answers, I would love to read them. You can email me at saltysciencepodcast at gmail.com. And also, just as a quick reminder, Friday, November 1st, we'll be airing the first listener's episode where myself and a fun surprise guest will be reading out your answers. Ooh, okay, there's my alarm saying I can now start running some of my samples for analysis. Woohoo! So until next week, don't forget to email me your listeners' answers, and remember to stay salty. Thank you for listening to Salty Science. But guess what? You don't have to let the fun end here. Go to www.saltysciencepodcast.weebly.com where I've posted some cool videos, my study notes, and some really neat experiments that you can try at home. And if you want to follow along with my own research, you can follow me on Instagram, user handle Teps Adventure. That's T-E-P-S Adventure. All Salty Science episodes are available on iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcast, and YouTube, plus a number of other podcasting apps. If you like the show, please rate, review, and subscribe on iTunes as this is the best way to spread the word about this podcast. Salty Science is listener supported, so if you would like to show your support, visit our Patreon page at www.patreon.com forward slash 
Salty Science, where you can either make a one-time donation of any amount or join the Salty Science crew for as little as a dollar a month. So visit the Salty Science Patreon and sign up today.